Wait, how does this? So I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for this invitation to speak here. Uh, and I'll try and end in 10 minutes so that there's some time for questions. Uh, I'm going to talk about melting of three sublattice disorder in frustrated antiferromagnets. Uh, and I should start by saying what this is. So let me do that. Uh, so we know that in many uh, insulating oxides, there are magnetic moments. And the magnetic moments uh, interact with each other through exchange interactions. Now, questions about when the exchange interactions are large, when they are small, what's their sign, things like that are difficult chemistry questions. But empirically, we know that many such materials have uh, ions with magnetic moments uh, that form a bipartite lattice. Uh, and they have dominant nearest neighbor exchange interactions of this form where J is a positive cross. And when that happens, uh, if you think of these as unit vectors classically, uh, the system likes to minimize its energy by having one sublattice point up along some spontaneously chosen direction in spin space and the other sublattice point down. That's the spontaneously chosen direction. And that's nail order. Studied, of course, 100 years ago by me, probably, almost. Uh, if you have uh, magnetic ions in lattices where the nearest neighbor connectivity makes triangles, uh, then nail order gets frustrated because if you pick any spontaneously chosen direction in spin space n, this spin point up along it, that point down along it, this one doesn't know. Um, and in such cases, you can get interesting physics at low temperature because the leading exchange interaction is not able to pick a ground state or a low temperature. And the uh, real physics is then the, the physics of fluctuations and subdominance. Uh, anisotropy, uh, which comes, of course, from spin orbit coupling physically, uh, and might choose a direction in spin space for you independently of everything else, uh, tends to amplify the effects of frustration. Simplest example to consider is, let's say, a single triangle. If you had isotropic exchange interactions, S dot S, you can minimize your energy by doing this. And there's a unique minimum up to global symmetry operations. But if you impose externally an easy axis, because there's some spin orbit coupling that couples the spins to the lattice structure of the crystal, and you're, you're picking this axis externally, then again, you're back to this situation where the system is frustrated very badly. Uh, and so uh, the most dramatic examples of uh, geometric frustration effects in antiferromagnets comes from uh, uh, anisotropic. Uh, so the simplest example you can think about along these lines, which is also physically very realistic in many cases, is you have some magnetic moments of spin S, bigger than one or one, uh, which have an exchange coupling, strong easy axis that picks the Z axis, easy axis and isotropy, uh, on let's say the triangular lattice. In this case, to leading order, you can just say that SZ likes to be plus S or minus S, and you can represent that by a sigma, which can be plus one or minus one. And you get Vonier's icing antiferromagnet on the triangular lattice. Uh, now, this has macroscopically many uh, zero energy configurations. In fact, every configuration of this icing model, where there's exactly one frustrated bond, two sigmas pointing in the same direction, and two unfrustrated bonds on every triangle of the triangular lattice, is a ground state. And the number of these ground states is the number of perfect dimer covers on the dual honeycomb lattice. Uh, I don't need to remind this audience of that. Uh, and what was calculated more than 50 years ago is that if you actually take the zero temperature limit, um, you find that the spin-spin correlations in this model decay as a power law, as a very slow power law. In fact, one over square root r is the dominant term, with an oscillatory factor multiplying it or modulating it. So this is incipient three sublattice order. Uh, and the reason I say that is that this wave vector is the wave vector that distinguishes the A, B, and C sublattices of the triangular lattice from each other. So there's a picture for that. So here's the triangular lattice. And if this ordering was not incipient, but actually long range ordered, then the icing spins would freeze into this pattern, uh, denoted by red, green, and blue dots. And actually, there's two patterns that correspond to long range order at this wave vector. Uh, one of them has no net moment and is genuinely antiferromagnetic. Uh, and if you want to understand what that pattern is, interpret every green dot in this picture as a spin that's fluctuating wildly between up and down, wildly and independently of everybody else. And that's the zero. Every red dot is a spin that points down. Every blue dot is a spin that points up. 
So the structure of the ground state is that there's wildly fluctuating spins, uh, and around them there are hexagons which have up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, alternating, so that there's no net exchange field on this side. So that's the anti-ferromagnetically three sublattice ordered low temperature state. There's a similar ferrimagnetic one you can make at the same wave vector with a somewhat different interpretation of the three colors. I don't need that for this talk, but I just mention it. Uh, so let's go with this prototypical example then of uh, uh, the effects of frustration. So you have this icing model and it has this incipient long range order and you can get genuine long range order by all sorts of small perturbations. The simplest small perturbation you can imagine adding is just a transverse field, a field in the x direction if the exchange interactions or the easy axis is in the z direction. As soon as you do that, you get long range order of this antiferrotype where one sublattice of spins is fluctuating wildly, one is up, one is down. And now zero doesn't mean fluctuating because of thermal fluctuation because this is all the way down at zero temperature you get this long range order in the quantum problem. This is actually quantum fluctuations that are driven by the gamma term that makes spins flip quantum mechanics. Okay. So it's known that there's this anti-ferro three sublattice ordered ground state as gamma is turned on. Uh, and it's also known that it's of this uh, type where there's absolutely no ferromagnetic moment in the ground state because the plus cancels the minus and this is anyway wildly fluctuating. Uh, and what I'm interested in is some physics having to do with the nature of this melting transition when I heat it up. So I have this low temperature state which is long range ordered, I heat it up, it melts, the long range order melts. What's known is that in this and in many other cases, uh, many more realistic models even, uh, the melting proceeds in two steps and there's an intermediate phase with power law long range order. So like this, so spin spin correlations along the easy axis are again power law with some eta that varies from one ninth to one quarter modulated by that vapor. Okay, two more minutes. So this brings us to the question, if you really wanted to see this in any new experiment uh, in the more realistic Hamiltonians that have the same low temperature phase, how would you see it? You would need to do something very subtle. You would need to do, let's say, a neutron scattering experiment where you have the ability to detect power law versions of Bragg T. Uh, or, you know, if you had uh, some, some other system which was described by similar physics uh, where you could actually scan uh, some local probe, you would get some real space data with some scanning of some local probe and do lots of image processing, right? Uh, like in, in engineered examples of liquid crystals, this is how people see hexatic phases. Uh, so it's pretty difficult. Uh, so the punchline of this talk is that you don't need to do that in this particular case. There's an alternate purely thermodynamic measurement that will provide you the same information. And that is this statement, that in this power law ordered phase, there is a singular susceptibility to just a uniform field along the easy axis. Now remember at low temperature, this is not a ferromagnet. There's no tendency to ferromagnetic order. Yet when I heat it up, the ferromagnetic uniform susceptibility in finite field becomes singular. And it becomes singular in this power law manner at small b. Uh, and this power can be predicted. And what we have done recently, so this is a recent prediction, and even more recently, we have checked that this works. So let me go to the last slide. So here I'm showing uh, the transverse field icing model, which we have uh, done large scale quantum Monte Carlo on with my student Sonak Vipas. And on the left panel, I'm showing you that uh, the susceptibility to a field that oscillates along this three sub lattice wave vector, which is the order parameter susceptibility, indeed diverges as L to the two minus eta, consistent with power law order. And on the right panel, I'm showing you that if I fit these with an eta and I use the same eta and try to fit these curves, I can fit to L to the two minus nine eta, saying that the ferromagnetic susceptibility also diverges, although a little bit more deeply. And then there's some standard finite size scaling that converts me from there to the prediction I mentioned earlier. So that's the talk. Thank you. For questions? So one is KT and the other is inverted KT. That's is this the whole story. Uh, that's Jose Cadenock for Kirkpatrick method. Six state clock model. So. But here, the only point here is that this order parameter couples to the uniform magnetization mode. So you can detect power law order in the order parameter. 
by making a measurement in this other uniform magnetization channel, which you have access to because that's a thermodynamic magnet. Yes. So similar discontinuity should be seen here also, no? Uh, so the analogous statement would be about the helicity modulus of the magnet. Okay. Now, of course, this is actually a discrete system where the U1 symmetry is emergent. So the physical field that corresponds to twisting the phase doesn't exist. So although you're right, there is no experimental access to that. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker once more and um, I invite Dr. Anik.